Good morning and welcome to our class on the Canons of Dort. Uh, I want to begin this morning with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the blessing of this continued study. And we pray that as we study these Canons of Dort, uh, that you would be glorified. That we'd, we would see your revelation that we would see the Scripture expounded upon and the doctrines of Your Word upheld. We pray that You would teach us through this. It would not be merely academic, but it would also be devotional. We pray this dependently in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today uh, we're going to dive into that first point, or that first head of doctrine of the Canons of Dort. Uh, However, before we do, I want to go back to our study last week. Now, hopefully, as you're coming in today, uh, you have completed our last class. If you haven't, maybe you ought to pause this and go back and uh, walk through the last class. Uh, But a couple of things that I want to address there. One, just simply an error. As soon as I finished teaching that class, I realized that I had spoken an error regarding uh, England and Scotland. I think, if I remember correctly, I had referred to the invitation being sent to King James and referred to it as the United Kingdom. Uh, But then I remembered, no, the United Kingdom did not come into being until the Union of 1707. So it clearly was not the United Kingdom in 1618 and 1619. King James was King James I of England and Ireland. He was King James VI of Scotland simultaneously. The other thing that I forgot to mention in last week's study uh, was about the word canon and the formation of the canons of Dort. Uh, The word canon uh, means a rule or a standard. It's derived from the Greek word that would be translated rule or standard. And so you can understand that the canons of Dort uh, are laying out specific rules or standards or doctrine regarding specific points. Uh, The canons of Dort, as I have explained before, are divided into five heads of doctrine. And again, per the previous study, oftentimes this has come through the ages to us as referred to as the five points of Calvinism. However, we're going to quickly find out that the canons of Dort don't fall along with the order of our acronym, that we typically remember as TULIP, uh, but uh, follow a different order, and then, of course, as I've argued before, are far more complex or robust in their the theology conveyed. Uh, each of the heads of the canons of Dort are divided into articles. So we'll begin today, for example, with the first head, with the first head of doctrine. But there'll be a number of articles that will be contained in each of those heads. And then at the conclusion of each head of doctrine, there will be, in addition to the articles, there will be a rejection of the Arminian doctrine. And so you can think of it this way. The, the doctrine will be stated positively in the articles, and then it will address, in, in, in a negative sense, a rejection of the Arminian doctrines that had been argued in the remonstrance. Uh, each head is a study in itself. In other words, as we begin today and look at the first head of doctrine or the first point, it is self-contained. And so you can take each of the five out, so to speak, and look at them individually. And each one of them are going to contain theology addressing man's sin as well as God's justice. Each head is going to include practical application for Christian living. We're going to find that these are very pastoral, as we would say, very practical in their teaching for the church. And then each head encourages Christian assurance of our salvation, which of course is tied into one of the heads specifically. Well, the, the canons of Dort were drafted, and they were drafted to be universally accepted and then practically used within the church. And so to speak, that has happened for us as well. Here we are in the 21st century also studying these heads of doctrine. Well, let's dive right in, and uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to start by reading the first article of the first head of doctrine, or the first point, and we're titling the study today by the title of 
predestination. And that's a summary statement that I'm using uh, to, to summarize this very first point or this first head of doctrine. Uh, again, I'm going to be reading from the translation that is included in the uh, Reformed Confessions of the 16th and 17th century in English translation. This is the fourth volume, and um, it is compiled and edited by James T. Dennison, Jr., uh, and uh, that he is not the one who did the translation uh, in this. Uh, I believe that they used the translation that was included in the 1976 Psalter hymnal of the Christian Reformed Church of North America. Nevertheless, it's a reliable translation uh, from the Latin, and so we'll, we'll look at this together. Uh, the Canons of Dort, first head of doctrine, divine election and reprobation. Again, my summary statement is predestination, uh, but in a, in a more elaborate sense, it's translated here, divine election and reprobation. First article, we're going to, uh, to look at several of the articles. We'll not make, through, make it through all of this first head of doctrine today, uh, but we'll look at several of the articles and uh, listen closely to this first article. Article 1. As all men have sinned in Adam, lie under the curse and are deserving of eternal death. God would have done no injustice by leaving them all to perish and delivering them over to condemnation on account of sin, according to the words of the Apostle, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be brought under the judgment of God. Romans 3.19 And, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 and for the wages of sin is death. So that's the first article. And let's consider what we've just read. Uh, the first is that it may surprise you, I know it certainly surprised me in studying the first article, that it doesn't begin with eternity past. Oftentimes when we think of uh, predestination, it may immediately take us to thinking about uh, Ephesians 1 and, and that we were predestined before the foundation of the world. And, and so in, in a technical sense, we would think, well, that's where they should be in. But they don't begin there. They begin with what? They begin with human sin. And, and this describes to us immediately with this first head of doctrine and this very first article that this is a document, including all five heads of doctrines, all five points, this is a document that is pastoral in nature. It is first addressing something that we all, we meaning all human beings, deal with. And that is a sin nature and we are sinners, as it has been quoted here, quoted from Scripture in this very first article. And oftentimes, as we see here addressed, uh, the argument against predestination may be, well, that's not fair. That doesn't sound fair to me that some are predestined unto salvation. Uh, this is a, a typical argument that many of us will encounter. And so they address that here, don't they? What they do is they ask, what does God, or what does God's justice require? What does God's justice require? Well, if you're a sinner and I'm a sinner, God's justice requires what? Our death. It doesn't require our, anything of God in terms of our salvation. We are sinners. We have offended a holy God. And so God is just in destroying us all. What then of mercy, you may ask? Well, we'll look at that in the coming articles but in terms of God's mercy, He is not obligated to extend mercy. His justice requires His wrath to be poured out on all who sin against Him as He is completely holy. And again, we hear this in this first article when they say, God would have done no injustice by leaving them all to perish 
and delivering them over to condemnation on account of sin. So that's the very first article. We can see here that they're approaching this from a pastoral perspective and also addressing some of the points that may be a pushback against the topic of predestination. Article 2. Let's look at this. But in this, the love of God was manifested, that He sent His only begotten Son into the world, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then it references 1 John 4, 9 and John 3, 16. And of course, it's paraphrasing John 3, 16 in that quote, as well as 1 John 4, 9. A little surprised, aren't you? Oftentimes people who uh, want to argue against predestination, well, they're going to pull out those two verses among others uh, as if those are proof texts against predestination. In the second article of the Canons of Dort, they actually use those two verses to argue for predestination. I want to consider in this answer three parts of God's love. Three key parts, or rather three key parts of God redeems us through the Son. God redeems us through the Son. Three key parts. The first is God's love. That we are redeemed in Christ because of the love of God. And indeed, God is love. The second key part for us to note in this second article is God's gift. God's gift. And we understand that God's gift is the Son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The third key part to note in this second article is God's promise. And that God's promise is eternal life to all who believe. And some want to argue against predestination and say, but, 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 it's just, it's just all who believe. And we would say, you're, you're right. You're right. And that doctrine does not stand against the doctrine of predestination, but in fact stands with it as the other articles are going to explain. So, three key parts to remember. God's love, God's gift, and God's promise. Third article. Let's look at this together. And that men may be brought to believe. God mercifully sends the messengers of these most joyful tidings to whom He will, and at what time He pleases. But those whose ministry men are called to repentance, uh, rather, by whose ministry men are called to repentance and faith in Christ crucified. Uh, and then it quotes Romans 10, 14 and 15. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? We're starting to see a refining of their argument, aren't they? And so we're going to refer to this third article as God sends preachers of redemption. Third article, God sends preachers of redemption. Redemption. In His mercy, God sends gospel preachers calling people to faith and repentance. And again, I I hate to keep beating this drum, but I find it so interesting that oftentimes people who want to argue against the doctrine of predestination will say, well, if if those who uh, are predestined are the only ones who go to heaven, the only ones who are saved, why even preach the gospel? Well, that wouldn't be faithful to Scripture, would it? No, they're going to address it head on here in this third article, that God sends preachers of redemption. It is through the preaching of God's Word that we believe, trusting, 
in Christ alone, repenting of our sin. Uh, to whom and when preachers are sent are up to God, His sovereignty. And that's a key point. A key point to note that God is the one who sends forth His preachers. God is the one who sends forth the evangelist, the missionary, so forth and so on, to preach the Word. And we don't understand this. It's a secret thing of God, but it is of God. Fourth article. You're doing a good job. We're moving straight ahead here. Fourth article. The wrath of God abides upon those who believe not this gospel. But such as receive it and embrace Jesus the Savior by a true and living faith are by Him delivered from the wrath of God and from destruction and have the gift of eternal life conferred upon them. We would summarize this fourth article as there is fruit of faith and there is fruit of unbelief. There's two kinds of fruit, so let's break it down this way. First of all, there is the fruit of unbelief. Those who do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ savingly, the wrath of God remains upon them. Faith is required. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved from eternal death and destruction. And so the, the first fruit is the, the fruit of unbelief. Those who hear the preaching of God's Word and they do not respond in faith. The second kind of fruit is a fruit of faith. Those who believe are saved from the wrath of God and so also inherit eternal life. And so these two fruits as described in the art the fourth article are a response to article 3 in the preaching of God's word article 5 the cause or guilt of this unbelief as well as of all other sins is no wise in God but in man himself whereas faith in Jesus Christ and salvation through Him is the free gift of God. As it is written, By grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Ephesians 2.8 Likewise, to you it hath been granted in behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, etc. That's Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. And in this fifth article, again, now we're seeing a, a, a more refining of uh, the doctors that, doctrines that have been previous, pre previously presented in these articles. In this fifth article, we might summarize as the guilt of unbelief and the gift of faith. The guilt of unbelief and the gift of faith. Uh, oftentimes, I will say that the only thing that I brought to my salvation is my sin. And that would be a good summary of what they're arguing here. Uh, God is not the one who causes our sin. Uh, God is not the one who leads us to sin. Uh, we are professional sinners. We do sin well. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, the guilt of our unbelief, those who hear the gospel presented and do not believe saving on the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, they do not believe and they are due the, the punishment, that, or we would say that the guilt of that unbelief remains upon them. Uh, all people are responsible for their sins. God is not responsible for your sins. But secondly, there is the gift of faith. And this is where the Arminians go way wrong on this in, in seeing that faith is something that is uh, that a, a byproduct 
of what we do. And again, in the remonstrance, I realize that they do tip their hat to the work of the Holy Spirit and so forth and so on. But, but as it's stated here in this Article 5, they're making it crystal clear that it really doesn't have anything to do with you conjuring up. I mean, think about it this way. What is a gift? Uh, did you earn it? Did you go out and work? No, that's not a gift. That's what? That's wages, a gift is something that you didn't merit, you didn't earn, that is bestowed upon you for nothing other than the desire of the gift giver. Faith is not responding to something we do, but rather it is a gift from God. Faith is a gift. Article 6. <clears throat> That some receive the gift of faith from God and others do not receive it proceeds from God's eternal decree. Now, pause there for just a second. Don't miss this. What did the first article begin with? Man's sin. And what have we walked through? We've walked through sin. We've walked through the necessity of faith. We've brought all the way down to the last article of God is the one who gives the gift of faith. Now... We're seeing the behind the scenes of what we have studied up until this point, or at least up until point five, or, or, or rather article five. In this article, it begins, I'm going to reread the words again, don't miss this, that some receive the gift of faith from God and others do not receive it proceeds from God's eternal decree. For known unto God are all His works from the beginning of the world. Acts 15, 18. Who worketh all things after the counsel of His will. Ephesians 1, 11. According to which decree He graciously softens the hearts of the elect, however obstinate, and inclines them to believe, while He leaves the non-elect in His just judgment to their own wickedness and obduracy. And herein is especially displayed the profound, the merciful, and at the same time the righteous discrimination between men equally involved in ruin, or that decree of election and reprobation revealed in the Word of God, which, though men of perverse, impure, and unstable minds rest it to their own destruction, yet to holy and pious souls affords unspeakable consolation. I know that's a long article, uh, and there's a, a lot of meat there. Uh, but the, the, the point, and, and let's, well, let's just start here. A summary of this, we could say, of Article 6 is, God gives faith according to His plan. Not yours, His. It's His plan uh, of, of salvation, or we refer to it as His eternal decree. Uh, and so... Uh, again, as I said before, uh, in the last point, is that uh, the, a gift is something that, that God gives. God gives the gift of faith. It's different from a wage. And therefore, if faith is a gift, may God give it to whom He pleases. Now think about that for just a moment. If we are all deserving of the wrath of God eternal condemnation, and yet God desires to, according to His plan, to give the gift of faith to one and not another. Isn't that His prerogative? He is indeed God. We are not deserving of its receipt, but God may choose to do what He pleases to do according to His plans, according to His purposes. He is, after all, God, and we are not. We refer to this, and they refer to it here as it's translated, as the eternal decree of God. Now, there are two aspects of God's eternal decree. decree. Uh, if you're taking notes, you'll want to note this. Two aspects of God's eternal decree. The first is, is the gift of faith to some manifesting what? 
The gift of faith to some manifesting what? His mercy. His mercy is shown to some. The second point of God's eternal decree is that He leaves others in their sin. Manifesting what? His justice. His justice is due. Now, this sixth point, uh, in many ways, draws from the Belgic Confession. Again, hopefully as you're watching this lecture today, uh, you have watched the previous videos, you do know that one of the first things that the Synod of Dort did was to uh, approve the Belgic Confession as a right uh, confession and a, 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 a secondary standard of the churches. And uh, that was to be understood within uh, the church of that day. And this sixth article actually draws from uh, quite a bit from the Belgic Confession. Uh, the Belgic Confession, Article 16 states this, and I'm going, to, I'm going to read to you this entire article, but what I want you to do is I want you to listen for the similar language or at least the similar theology that we hear in this sixth article of the Synod of Dort. Belgian Confession, Article 16. We believe that all the posterity of Adam, being thus fallen into perdition and ruined by the sin of our first parents, God then did manifest Himself such as He is, that is to say, merciful and just. Merciful, since He delivers and preserves from this perdition all whom He is His eternal and unchangeable counsel of mere goodness, has elected in Christ Jesus our Lord, without any respect to their work. Just in leaving others in the fall and perdition wherein they have involved themselves. Now, as the Belgic Confession uh, teaches or states here, uh, that, um, uh, that people may uh, believe that, that somehow it's an, an eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and that all are innocent before God. Uh, but what is stated in Article 6, and as it has been argued from the very beginning of that first article, is that, no, we're, we're actually all guilty. We're all guilty of sin, all fallen in sin. We are all due God's justice. And yet, God, in His purposes, His secret pleasure, has chosen some that may receive the gift of faith, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Receiving the mercy of God, uh, eliminating, or not eliminating, but, but being saved from uh, God's wrath and unto eternal life. And there are others who, in their sin, deserving the justice of God, God passes over and they remain in their sin. As you heard it referred to in Article 6, it referred to as the non-elect at the conclusion of that sixth article, uh, there's also some language there uh, that sort of tips its hat uh, regarding the Arminians. Uh, they, in essence, people may try to manipulate God's Word to contradict the truth of God's eternal decree. That's a slight at the Arminians. But actually, trusting God as His Word does what? Well, in the words of this sixth article... It affords unspeakable consolation. And I know that to be true, and I know many of you know that to be true as well. Uh, that a right understanding of the doctrine of predestination actually affords unspeakable consolation. To know that uh, God is God. And God has sovereignly elected His children unto eternal life. And they are the ones, though, deserving of God's justice, receive by the work of the Holy Spirit that gift of faith to believe and repent, trust savingly on Christ. Well, we're going to conclude today with this sixth article. We're going to pick up next week on that seventh article. Uh, but I want to conclude before I pray with this. Uh, you may be watching this video today and you may be wondering, 
Well, am I one of the elect? Well, I want you to go back to that first article. Are you one who is a sinner? No, well, indeed, we all are. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Are you convicted of your sin and desiring to trust savingly on the Lord Jesus Christ? Then the Holy Spirit is at work upon you. At this very moment, let me encourage you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Trust savingly in Christ and you will receive the mercy of God and receive the gift of eternal life. Let me pray for us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I do pray that any watching this class today, this video today, that have not believed savingly on the Lord Jesus Christ, that in this moment they would trust Him as their Savior and Lord. I pray for this, those of us who have trusted in Christ, that this would be a time of encouragement, of, of unspeakable consolation, that You, are God, has saved us in Christ. And though deserving eternal damnation, uh, we have received Your mercy. And so we thank You for this. In fact, it is the gospel. It is the good news. And we rejoice in it. We pray that You'd bless our time today. Bless also our continued study. For we pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, indeed our Savior. Amen.